What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. So I thought for a change of pace, I would talk about something different, okay, in this video. Um, a lot of times when we're reading about history, they omit things in articles or history books or textbooks, or they straight up lie to you. And what's kind of making me do this video or inspiring me to do this video is the fact that, you know, it looks like in certain schools, they are going to start redefining what they want to tell kids or teach kids or, you know, omit certain things. So I always believe in telling the truth as things are, as things were, all right? So the man in this image, his name was James A. Garfield. And he served as the 20th president of the United States from March 4th, 1881 to September 19th, 1881. Now, you might be wondering why his term started in March instead of January. Well, back in those days, the presidential term started on March 4th. It wasn't changed until January 20th until 1937 and the reason why they sped it up is because they started thinking that you know the transition process needed to start faster all right between the outgoing and incoming president that was part of it and um you know so it, it technology had advanced to the point where it didn't have to take an incoming president months of travel to get to D.C. and things of that nature and all the other people. So they sped it up. But anyway, um, you also may be wondering, why did he only serve as president for six months? Well, unfortunately, he was assassinated. Well, at least that's what the textbooks will tell you. The textbooks will tell you that he was assassinated by a disgruntled office seeker named Charles Guiteau, right? Now, Charles Guiteau was a schizophrenic, all right? Charles Guiteau was a nut job, okay? Um, he had delusions of grandeur. Um, all the evidence state and point to him being mentally ill. Ironically, he had worked on the campaign for president for, for uh, Garfield in 1880, when Garfield went against, uh, I think his name was, the Democrat candidate name was Winfield S. Hancock. Yes, laugh at that name all you want to. It's funny too, Hancock, you know. But uh, Garfield won, and the issue of that campaign pretty much boiled down to corruption in, in the, uh, Washington, the spoil system, and also, oddly, Chinese immigration. Those were some big issues in the 1880 election. James A. Garfield won. James A. Garfield could have been one of our better presidents. Uh, he was a staunch abolitionist. Uh, he was very intelligent. He, had, uh, he was a, a very uh, deaf politician as far as uh, measuring his moves when it came to his opponents and he had some strong allies in Congress. He had been a congressman. As a matter of fact, he is still, if I'm not mistaken, the last, or he might be the only, I have to think about that. I do know this. He's either the last or only. I gotta think whether he's the, I do know this. He's the last congressman to be directly elected to the presidency. Everyone after that are either senators, governors, uh, or generals, all right? But James A. Garfield was an opponent of the spoil system where people were rewarded for, um, you know, being an ally of, you know, an official or 
You know, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. The spoil system pretty much started to be in place since Andrew Jackson, all right? Garfield believed that you should get a job based on your own merit. So obviously, this would piss off a person like Charles Gateau, who thought that, A, he was owed something. He felt that he should have gotten a uh, prestigious job. He was more of a supporter, by the way, of the vice president, uh, Chester A. Arthur, who was a disciple of, I think his name was Roscoe Conklin, right? Roscoe Conklin was at the time probably the most influential and most powerful senator in the United States and also probably one of the most corrupt, all right? Um, Roscoe Conklin was the epitome of the spoil system and corruption in, in Washington. But anyway, let me get to the point. On July 2nd of 1881, James A. Garfield, who was accompanied by James Blaine, who would go on to become the 1884 Republican nominee for president, they both arrived at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in Washington, D.C. This, was, this had already been publicized in newspapers. So Charles Gateau was there. He had decided in his mind that he was going to shoot the president. So minutes after James A. Garfield's arrival, he shoots Garfield. The first shot was superficial, grazed his arm. The second shot penetrated Garfield's back, right? It nicked his spine but did not sever his spinal column. And the bullet miraculously missed all of his vital organs. As a matter of fact, had this happened in today's world, James A. Garfield, had he been shot today, he would have probably been in the hospital no longer than three or four days and discharged. But because of the disgusting practices of his doctors, he had a very painful and lingering death. All right, he lingered on for another what, two plus months? And was really killed by his doctors, all right? Now, ironically, the doctor that killed him, his name was actually Dr. Do I think it was, his name was Dr. Willard or William Bliss or something like that. And... Um, <clears throat> He had known Garfield for decades. They had been friends. Um, Bliss was a very controversial figure. Bliss also was an egomaniac who had treated patients during the Civil War and thought that he was the most qualified doctor. When all of the doctors had first attended Garfield, they started doing things like sticking their fingers in his open wound to try to retrieve the bullet. Uh, they uh, messed with his wound constantly, like digging in there, trying to find it and things like that. Um, what this eventually did was create a, a larger wound than was there before and by them not washing their hands. This was not the standard practice at the time. Doctors, most doctors at least, were not aware of germs, uh, washing your hands, uh, infections, things of that nature. They weren't aware of this yet. Or at least most doctors didn't uh, respect the theory of germs. They couldn't see it, so they didn't see it as a threat. Um, basically what happened is their treatments were of the standards of the day, you know, giving him 
formulas to vomit and, and you know, uh, when he couldn't, when he developed fevers, you know, they would uh, apply gauzes and give him rum, whiskey, and, you know, just stupid shit, you know. I mean, I hate to say stupid shit, but shit today you look at like, what the fuck, you know. But it ultimately made his condition worse. All these different doctors and people sticking, like I said, sticking their fingers in his wounds. Um, him being in a somewhat unsanitary situation, not changing his sheets regularly. So what eventually happened is after a period of what appeared to be convalescence where he was getting better, because of the doctors uh, fucking with his wounds and you know, not washing their hands and unsanitary conditions, he started developing infections. And I mean massive infections. Um, he couldn't keep food down because unbeknownst to the doctors, he developed a severe abscess in his stomach. Um, he had another major abscess that developed in his ear canal where when it burst, blood and fluid and pus came out of his ears or out of one ear at least um, he was just starting to become festering with pus and, and and infections and you know this is way before penicillin like this is what 50 years or so before the development of penicillin this was just before like I said before they start realizing how important it was to keep a sanitized and clean uh, and, and sterile con uh, room for a person who, especially a gunshot victim. So what happened was Garfield began to waste away. James A. Garfield was six feet one and about 230 pounds the day that he got shot. He was a rather robust man for the times. By the time he died, James A. Garfield weighed 130 pounds. Before he passed away, they thought, hey, you know, let's get him out of Washington. Let's put him, you know, let's have him in an area near the coast where he could, the fresh air where we reinvigorate him and bring him on a path to recovery. Well, in reality, you know, they still did the same shit. You know, not uh, washing their hands and just reintroducing more and more germs into his body until he just became a germ fest. And on September the 19th, 1881, James A. Garfield suffered a massive heart attack brought, up, brought on by the sheer inflammatory uh, you know infectiousness of his body he was 49 years old and he was killed by his doctors his doctors not by the bullet not by the assassin now Charles Guteau was eventually uh, 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 you know killed uh, well I don't want to say killed he was eventually uh, I think he was hanged for killing the president, but in reality, he didn't kill the president. He didn't. He wounded him. But James A. Garfield, even in the practices of those times, even with the limitations and medications and technology at that time, he still should have recovered from that bullet wound. And he's not the first president to walk around with bullets in him. Andrew Jackson had been wounded during a duel back in, what, eight, the 1810s? 18, no, 1805, 1806 or something like that. And for the 40 year, last 40 years of his life, he had uh, two bullets in his body. And, he, and his wounds were more severe than what James A. Garfield had uh, dealt with. Painful, yes. But James A. Garfield should have survived and went on to have a distinguished career as a president. But he was killed by his fucking doctors. And the history books aren't going to say that. 
But anyway, tell me what you guys think.